BDOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia. Well, I was just watching the trailer for The Murder of Nicole Brown Simpson with Mena Suvari, which is going to be coming out later this year, and uh, this is now October of 2019, and the film should be coming out in December. I'm definitely going to be watching this one because we've talked about the O.J. Simpson case a lot on this channel, and this is, you know, just a good opportunity to have lots of discussions on a lot of the alternative theories, because, like, I've been very critical of a lot of other news outlets and uh, media sources, and even the other podcasts, for saying that they refuse to talk about alternative O.J. Simpson theories. My biggest claim for that is just, if you have something to say then say it. If there's a reason why you think that this very popular alternative theory is false, well then, okay, give your piece why. I mean, if you can debunk it so easily, then go for it. And I do give some credit to Martin Sheen for producing the six-part miniseries about the possibility that Jason Simpson could have committed the murders, and I think that provided a lot of clarity on that one, because, like, the mur the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson is going to be a film that is going to explore the possibility of the Glenn Rogers theory. We did an entire upload on this channel before, so we're not really going to kind of go through step by step everything that Glenn Rogers did. But he was indeed a serial killer who was known as the Casanova Killer, and um, that's maybe be would be one of the ways that you could find him online. Glenn Rogers is someone who was definitely messed up. He was definitely someone who exhibited antisocial behavior. He was always pushing things to the extremes. But um, I'm really quite curious how they're going to portray this on film because now, like, I do... Th I'm just quite curious about it in general because it's like this is an uncertain thing that they would be putting forward. It is a theory, right? It's not a fact, and it's not even, like, in something like a scientific theory or anything. It's a true crime theory. They don't have any certainty about what would have happened with uh, Glenn Rogers. And um, if you're going to, for the people who think that O.J. Simpson committed the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman back in 1994, um, one of the big things that we all just have to kind of admit is that might be lost to history. I mean, whatever was going on in those exact moments might be lost. I mean, to the people who say that it was only O.J. Simpson that had committed those murders, and it wasn't Glenn Rogers, and it wasn't Jason Simpson, and it, it wasn't the Colombians, and it wasn't anything to do with the drug connection that La Mazaluna. If you just think that O.J. Simpson committed the murders, we'll probably never know the exact details. And why? Um, I mean, O.J.'s own admission in the book, If I Did It, and it's not an admission, of course, this was something that the ghostwriter Pablo Finieves co concocted, but just saying that he doesn't remember it. When I said O.J.'s admission, he said this during the Judith Regan interview, when he was just like, he was like, he doesn't remember the, um, the stabbings and such. And that is something that you definitely do experience when you're, like, um, looking at people who get overpowered with not only adrenaline, but also the kind of sights of blood and just violence and such. I was just listening to an episode of Case Cracked from the Lord and Arts channel, and they're talking about one guy, um, committed, like, a massive stabbing, but he probably didn't remember it because he was just wasn't accustomed to that type of violence people can block things out of their memory. And, I mean, if you, if you entertain anything to do with the O.J. Simpson theory, it's probably just... He probably doesn't even remember it. But at the same time, someone like Glenn Rogers, he probably would remember that because Glenn Rogers was a serial killer. Now, I think that it's very important to have the conversation about Glenn Rogers and Nicole Brown Simpson, number one, because it was neglected from a lot of other things, 25 years ago, and uh, number two is because a serial killer was in Nicole Brown Simpson's inner circle, and there are these things, was he conspiring with OJ, was he making up a plan with OJ, were they actually, was he actually breaking into Nicole Brown Simpson's house to re retrieve a pair of earrings worth $20,000, I mean, they want to explore the connection, but the biggest thing to note is, Nicole Brown Simpson had a serial killer in her inner circle, and they're trying to present this in the film with Mena Suvari as that they were, like, romantically involved, that they were having sex. I mean, I've only seen the trailer. Like I said, this is kind of just a preview. You can't even call it a film review because the movie isn't out yet. It's kind of just, like, what we're going to be expecting and anticipating. But um, from what I've heard in the documentary, My Brother the Serial Killer is more about um, the possibility that they were just kind of like 
like Rogers was interested in her, but they had gone out for drinks like two times, and that was the kind of the extent of their relationship. R Glenn Rogers was a handyman. He had done some work for Nicole Brown Simpson, although sources have stated, like the other kind of true crime media out there state that they are they aren't exactly certain that he about what kind of work he actually did on on the on the Brown property. Um, like, I mean, but the short, in the short, I mean, almost all parties are in somewhat of an agreement that this serial killer knew Nicole Brown Simpson, and then that he, um, had interactions with her, and, like, even if it's just going out for drinks two times, who necessarily knows how intimate they were, but at the same time, um, I mean, you know, Glenn Rogers' method of execution was stabbing. He killed the majority of his victims by stabbing them, the Casanova killer, and is no... I think, though, that this would be a very interesting thing that could have been portrayed perhaps better in, well, a six-part miniseries exploring the possibility like the way they did with Jason Simpson. Let's call up Martin Sheen and see if he's willing to uh, produce another one, and um, if he won't do it, maybe Emilio Estevez will. But at the same time, I really think that it might be kind of... I hope they really try to stay as close as they can to some of the genuine facts because they're really going to be kind of dealing with something that could turn into a case of playing with fire if they're going to be talking about the possibility that Glenn Rogers murdered Nicole Brown and, and Ron Goldman, or maybe that um, I think what they're going to do with this one is, and once again, this is a preview, they're probably just going to leave it up to the, um, the viewers. They aren't necessarily going to show whether it was Glenn Rogers or Ron Goldman. Oh, well, oh, excuse me, I misspoke there. They aren't necessarily going to show you whether it was Glenn Rogers committing the murder or O.J. Simpson committing the murders of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. What I would say about this is that um, I think that this, I think that Nicole Brown Simpson is a very good t subject for a movie because I was watching the, the show, The Final 24, The Last 24, whatever it's called. I only saw one episode and it, it deals with kind of documenting the last 24 hours of somebody's life, and they chose to do one on Nicole Brown Simpson. And you really see that the relationship between Nicole Brown Simpson and O.J. Simpson is very complicated in terms of emotions. It's very simple in terms of actions. I mean, Nicole Brown Simpson was working as a server, and O.J. would go frequently to her establishment trying to hit on her. He's like, I want that girl. And, um, eventually he got her and he married her and he became very abusive i mean that's it's simple in terms of actions what's complicated are the emotions that they experienced between each other in the sense that um on the day that nicole brown simpson died she went to la mezzaluna with her family it was after sydney simpson's dance recital they went to la mezzaluna oj simpson was not present and nicole brown simpson says that oj is my soulmate on the day that she was murdered, I mean, this is like three or four hours prior to her murder, she said, he's my soulmate. Even after all the abuse, he's my soulmate. She says something to that effect. So um, that's why I thought that this could really, I mean, the life of Nicole Brown Simpson could really turn into something that would be um, an excellent topic for a movie. But they decided to explore the possibility that Glenn Rogers committed the um, O.J. Simpson murders. I mean, like, we should say that the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. I mean, can't, can't really just call it the O.J. Simpson murders. I mean, it's just like, it's too much of a messy situation for that. But what I would say about um, exploring this potential theory is just that it's going to receive a lot of backlash. It's probably going to receive a lot of critical panning because a lot of people just do not want to hear it. They do not want to entertain any possibility. They're like, no, it was O.J. and O.J. alone. And the first time I ever tried to have a conversation with somebody about the O.J. Simpson alternative theories, it was the Jason Simpson theory. I had just watched the documentary O.J. is Guilty but Not of Murder by William C. Deer. I mean, it's the documentary was, of course, based on that particular book. He repackaged the book as O.J. is Innocent and I Can Prove It. And, um, I mean, someone was just like, no. OJ killed those two people. And I was like, well, I mean, there is this, like, no, OJ killed those two people. Like, other people just are not even willing to um, listen to anything. And for the longest time, I supported um, the accomplice theory that it was indeed OJ Simpson and um, he uh, committed the murders, but he had some sort of accomplice involved. Or at the very least, that there were two pre people involved with this. I've said that for uh, for ages. And um, one of the big reasons is it's just like um, 
O.J. Simpson came away from this without a single scratch on him, minus the cut on his hand. And uh, some things that you hear about in a variety of sources, they say that there was no blood on the glass in, in, in Chicago, because that's how O.J. gave the explanation for, for getting the cut on his hand, um, that he cut it on a glass in Chicago when he found out his ex-wife had died. Uh, he didn't ask which one, though. He didn't ask if it was his um, first ex-wife um, or Nicole Brown Simpson. He knew it was Nicole Brown who had uh, passed away. But um, apparently, though, one of the sources, though, I forget which one, it might even have even been during the trial when they said that um, there was indeed blood on that glass. And um, some guy was on this one thing on Radio.com. It was a show I'd never heard of before. I want to say it was called Arcand. And they were talking about the alternative O.J. Simpson stuff. It was a sports radio show. And um, one of the things with O.J. Simpson is it's heavily connected to the sports world. And ESPN did like an entire 40-minute segment on O.J. Simpson just talking about the true crime stuff. Like, I mean, they had one question to the audience, should O.J. Simpson be allowed in the Hall of Fame? And, I mean, to answer that question very quickly, um, I would say, I mean, yes, because, like, are we going to just ban every person from the hall of the nfl hall of fame because of their actions off the field what they're really trying to do is they're really trying to just sort of um a lot of people are really encouraging the nfl to stay out of non-football matters to stay out of off the field matters they believe that it's creating like a just sort of very bad precedent for the sports world to um kind of enforce a sort of a code of off-field conduct when other sports are not doing that and they think that it's kind of just making things a little bit more complicated and they just want to be like all right you know he was the jews he ran for 2,000 yards in a season 2003 i think first 2,000 yard rusher in nfl history and um all right i mean you want to put him in the nfl hall of fame it's like um no matter what i mean like the only reason why someone would be removed for the for the whole from the hall of fame is um if they were if they were cheating, like, and such, but, um, and, like, unless they, the thing is, though, O.J. Simpson was also found not guilty, so it'd be like, how would you be able to remove someone from the Hall of Fame if they were found not guilty of the crime? In the short, I just, like, I don't really want the NFL dealing with too many off-the-field issues. Look at all that crap we dealt with with the NFL national anthem protests and such. It's just, it's just media hatred and vitriol being spewed around and such, and, um, okay, but, uh, excuse me for that giant tangent but you know i'm a sports fan and such and we kind of deal with this stuff all the time when we don't have to let's just watch the damn games for goodness sake and um when you're dealing though with the possibilities of um how oj simpson though affects the uh, true crime world like i said the sports radio show in boston um was called arcan but they're talking about kind of just they asked some people, like, what are your reasons about why you would think that O.J. Simpson could be innocent? Or what do you think happened with the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman? And one of the guys said very clearly, um, he's like, listen to F. Lee Bailey's cross-examinations. And F. Lee Bailey, of course, one of O.J. Simpson's dream team attorneys, is someone that I don't trust that much. But, um, I mean, he's definitely a kind of a sleazy guy. He was disbarred. And um, F. Lee Bailey can even comes up in the Zodiac Killer mystery, like, if, like, you know, once you get into some of the deeper stuff, but, um, he's, like, a very, um, well, he's someone who really wants to kind of prop himself up and just latch on to many different things for his own personal benefit. I don't necessarily trust him that much, but at the same time, I mean, this guy said that on the show. He's, like, a, this is a call-in, mind you, just, like, some guy calling into the show saying, the thing that convinced him was, listen to F. Lee Bailey's cross-examinations. And F. Lee Bailey um, said in his own words that, before you say anything about the O.J. Simpson case, read the 17,000 words that I've written on my website, talking about F. Lee Bailey's website. We did a whole upload on the channel, O.J. Simpson, F. Lee Bailey theories. Because it's like, even though I don't like him that much, maybe he has something to say. And you try to approach things with an open mind, you know, just because, I mean, you don't like someone's personality, it doesn't mean that they can't offer for a certain sense of, um, well, a, a different perspective or new facts and information just because, I mean, okay, I don't like his character and, I mean, I, maybe I wouldn't be friends with a guy or something like that, but maybe he has something that he can share. So after hearing that, I, did, I decided to uh, listen to a little bit more of F. Lee Bailey's cross-examinations. And, you know, he does um, bring up some kind of things that are almost like what you would say factual assertions as opposed to opinions and just legalese. For example... They say on the night of Nicole Brown Simpson's murder, 
O.J. Simpson was at Sidney Simpson's dance recital. We already talked about that. That happened kind of in the early evening, late afternoon. And they're all saying O.J. just wasn't himself. He was just a different person. He was just, um, he was, it was there was just somebody else there. It wasn't like he was um, himself, you know, like, and then that was something I began to think, hmm, perhaps something set O.J. off that day. But at the same time, when you actually do listen to F. Lee Bailey's cross-examination, it's like, they say, do you mean this guy? And they play a video of O.J. Simpson at Sidney Simpson's dance recital, standing outside the auditorium, talking to people, laughing and smiling. Y you mean, like, like this guy here? And um, when they actually bring in all of the witnesses that talked about O.J. Simpson signing autographs for them at the airport, the person who sat next to him on the, pa on the plane, no one reports seeing any sort of... Um, any sort of cuts on his hand. One guy said he was even looking at O.J. Simpson's hand to see if he was wearing a championship ring, and that was also didn't uh, take place. Um, and, like, I mean, I don't know why he would do that, because when I think of the Buffalo Bills, I don't think about winning championships. Sorry. No, no, that's a bad joke. I'm, uh, of course, O.J. Simpson had championship rings for a variety of things. I mean, I mean, like, I'm totally joking. They get AFC championship rings for for the Buffalo Bills, even though that's post O.J. Simpson, no, no, but um, <laughs> good luck winning the Super Bowl, Buffalo. Aside from um, all my bad sports humor that is not funny, um, it's just multiple people to said that they saw no cuts on his hand, and that there was, I mean, he's signing autographs on white paper, and also, I mean, I really was very disappointed in the prosecution for sort of saying that um. They believed that he was destroying the evidence at the in the trash receptacle at LAX airport. So in, the, in short, they believe he committed the murders of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. He drove back from Bundy to Rockingham, and that he um you know got his bags. Kalo Kato Kalen Kato Kalen damn alliteration. Kato Kalen wanted to um help OJ load some bags into the limo. And then O.J.'s like, no, don't touch that. You don't touch that specific bag or something. And that apparently was O.J.'s travel bag. And the prosecution that has this whole narrative about how O.J. would have gone to the trash receptacle and dropped the evidence, the murder evidence, into the trash receptacle, the can. And um, then, um, okay, that's, how it, that's why they were never able to recover those specific items. Okay, then. So, um, well, what do we make of that? I mean, I mean... The witness statements on that one that the prosecution was using are just very, very flimsy. You saw somebody drop something into a trash can? Yeah, he opened the zipper compartment on his travel bag and he dropped something into a trash can. So fucking what? I mean, like, that's just, it's not a very, it's not a very hard piece of evidence. Um, so I'm just not really, um, impressed with that. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And I thought they would just say more like he was forcing just like a shopping bag loaded with stuff into, you know, a trash can and pressing it down and just very obvious. Not to mention nobody looked in to examine what it was. And not, not that they should or anything. I mean, some guy dropped something into a trash can. Big deal. And also, um, just because someone didn't notice the cut on his hand, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I just think that um, the prosecution did a very poor job constructing that, and um, I do think that perhaps, you know, the family of Nicole Brown is kind of dealing with the tragedy in their own way, saying that O.J. Simpson just seemed, he didn't seem like himself on the night of the murder, he didn't seem like himself at Sidney Simpson's dance recital, but, um, I mean, that that's a very famous thing, though. I've heard that from multiple sources, that his behavior seemed very weird at the dance recital that happened in the late afternoon. Um, late afternoon, early evening, on the night that Nicole and Ron were murdered. And the only thing to really say about that is just that it's possible that, um, it's possible that maybe the family is kind of projecting some things onto the past. Because you can see the videos of him, he's just like laughing, smiling, talking to people, making small talk, and I think that that's kind of blown out of proportion. Um, I do admit, though, there is there is time for OJ to have committed the murders and then gotten back from Bundy to Rockingham and you know like there is that time frame does exist it only takes six and a half minutes to get from Bundy to Rockingham and that's by obeying the traffic lights because there are multiple ways that you can drive I mean there are multiple city streets and such furthermore though um there is time for that to take place 
And when we're going to be looking at, like, the way they're going to be portraying this Glenn Rogers thing, I don't think it's something that should be downplayed. I don't think it's something that should be overlooked. I don't think that it's something um, that should be uh, forgotten. I mean, we should be exploring what happened. Because Glenn Rogers, you know, in terms of following true crime, he has his own story. You know, he was a serial killer who deserves to be in jail for his crimes. And people should really just investigate the connection between Glenn Rogers and Nicole Brown Simpson. I don't think investigation is a bad thing. I don't know how well to do it in sort of like a kind of fictionalized dramatization, you know, like this Mena Suvari film that's going to be coming out. I don't know if that would be the best example, because um, I think it would be so much better to just have investigators exploring the possibility. And once again, like if they think that they can provide an alternative that's more convincing, all right, then do it. I mean, show us. Show us how. And uh, maybe the fictional film will do that. And when I say fictional, I mean, this is a film that is going to be based on true events. I mean, like, inspired by true events. They're probably going to get fluffy on some details. And as I said in the beginning, the true part of the story probably is lost. I don't think there's a single person alive that would be able to know what would happen, unless this Charlie guy that they talk about is a real person. But, um... That's all we can really say. The only thing I would say that I've never heard from any other true crime source is that um, what if there is something where it's like, um, is that Jason Simpson was the one who went to O.J. Simpson on the night of Nicole Brown's uh, murder, and um, he was like, in, in the If I Did It book, O.J. Simpson is saying that Charlie came to him and said that there's something going down at Nicole Brown Simpson's house. What if that didn't happen like that? What if it was actually Jason Simpson that came to O.J. and was like, Nicole was supposed to come to my restaurant tonight with 10 friends. We had a table reserved for 11. Jason worked at a restaurant called Jackson's, and he was a chef there. They were supposed to come to his restaurant to try his food, and they didn't show up. And he was very angry about that. He goes to O.J. Simpson and says, Oh, yeah, you know, she really let me down. I mean, I was looking forward to that. So then O.J. says, Well, I'm going to go. I'm going to go confront her about that. And then O.J., well, that was the kind of triggering event that pushed O.J. to go to... um that to leave Rockingham and go to Bundy on the night of the murders. So maybe it wasn't anything to do with the dance recital. Maybe there wasn't any weird behavior that was going on at the dance recital. And um, then that would be something that kind of kind of kick-started the incident. And that would, um, wouldn't necessarily require Glenn Rogers to be there. But um, a serial killer who stabbed people to death was affiliated with Nicole Brown Simpson, and she died from stab wounds. I mean... I would say, though, that O.J. was violent, though. That's something that we cannot deny. He was violent. Jason Simpson was also violent. He had, he attacked his ex-girlfriend with a knife and tried to cut her hair off with a knife. Not to mention that both O.J. and both O.J. Simpson, Jason Simpson, and, well, and even Glenn Rogers, all three of them carried knives. I mean, it's just like, I mean, things are just like, kind of like all... Do you want to use tally marks on destructive behavior, violent behavior, antisocial behavior, aggressive behavior, and they all like to carry knives or something? It's just, um, it gets a little bit messy when you examine things like that. But the, f the heart and soul of what we want to say today is that um, we're going to we're gonna watch this new film with Mena Suvari about the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson. The second thing to say is that um, the O.J. Simpson narrative has been incredibly skewed and that certain things have been misrepresented to the general public. Mostly, I mean, they're trying to build up a stronger case to kind of vilify O.J. Simpson in the court of public opinion. And you have to bear in mind, though, that um, I'm not... This, this, this upload here is not exactly endorsing any particular theory other than the fact that it acknowledges the possibility that Jason Simpson could have been the one who provoked O.J. into some sort of rage, and then that led to him going to... Uh, to Bundy that night, and it's possible Jason could have even been in the car, but, um, once again, I mean, I mean, I, what I'm trying to say is that it's possible that Jason Simpson is Charlie, but we don't know that 100%. I mean, we're gonna sort of get a better explanation about Charlie from the Glenn Rogers movie, The Murder of Nicole Brown Simpson, that they're talking about there, but, um, the other thing is, the media, when the media neglects things, they do neglect the possibility that Glenn Rogers is connected to all this because they just, uh, they have their narrative that they want to go with, and he challenges that. What do you have to say about any of the things we've discussed so far? That's all for me now, and until next time.